Number 63, Liggett versus Lou Realty. Uh, good afternoon, Roger Sacker, Newman Ferrara. Uh, may I request four minutes of rebuttal time, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Uh, may it please the court. Uh, the analysis here starts with Rent Stabilization Code, Section 2521. It tells us how the rent after an apartment decontrol is set. And it says it's the rent agreed to by the landlord. Yes, sir. If, if we agree with you, uh, this is a motion to dismiss, right? So if, if we were to reverse, deny the motion to dismiss, what's your view of what happens next? What happens next is a question of whether or not there's fraud. And we can talk a lot about uh, Regina's footnote seven and go down that path in the recent legislation. Well, why is that the next question? Because if there's fraud, you set the rent one way, and that's by the use of the default formula. If there is so, not- So is it your view that there would be no other way? I, I take it right now, the, the question is, does the 2000 stipulation provide a permissible path to deregulation, right? Correct. Okay, so so if, as Judge Garcia said, we were to agree with you that the answer to that is the 2000 stip itself doesn't do that, why wouldn't the landlord have an opportunity to pursue other paths to proving that the apartment would have been lawfully deregulated, for example, by application of the formula? But, I'm sorry, by application of which by, formula? By, app, by considering what increases would have been permissible and, and whatever vacancies occurred in the intervening time. I'm saying why wouldn't there be another bite at the apple to demonstrate that the apartment would have been lawfully deregulated? Because there's no starting point. Because when you're taking a vacancy increase, for example, you're taking, you know, it used to be, there's no longer the law, but you're taking 20% off of something. And what you're trying to do is unscramble the egg. But that the, the, to try this another way, the, what is arguably against public policy is there's no challenge to the fair market rents that was set at that time. I don't agree. No, the first starting point is it's not the fair market rent. The starting point is that they never set the rent properly in the first place. Okay. So why isn't the remedy, you go back, you determine what the fair market rent was then, and then you apply whatever they would have been entitled to to see if it's now decontrolled? Because of your majority opinion in Regina. You can't go beyond four years to determine what the legal regulated rent is. This is what I was trying to get at. You have two options. Option number one, default formula. Wait a minute, but you can't go beyond four years when there's a lease in place. That would be the, the rule limiting an overcharge. But if the declaration or the, the result of this appeal is that that stipulation that, that was entered into, and in, I think it was the year 2000, 1999, yeah. is void, there's no agreement. There's no statute of limitations to, to worry about. We've been, you know, we've been living under a, a nullity for the last 24 years. So why can't we go back, figure out what the fair market rent should have been at the time Mr. McKinney was given his lease, and then add in whatever increases that the law allowed up to today and determine whether or not the apartment's regulated, deregulated, and what the next permissible rent increase should be? Because you can't, because you've been telling all of these tenants who've been vacating, hey, you're not rent stabilized. Well, so, I mean, how many tenants are we talking about here? We, we don't even know how many in the interim. You know, there's a big difference in New York City between paying 650 and paying 1650. Let if I have me, a 650 let apartment. Can, let me see if I can get at this a different way. Suppose we knew there was no fraud. Do you lose? No, you just set the rent at the four year rule. You, set, you only go back four years. Absolutely, that's what Regina so, says. Why, well, Regina is talking about a situation, though, where we're not talking about the first rent after decontrol, right? We're talking about subsequent rents where the first rent after decontrol has been established through a means that nobody is challenging. This seems to be a different situation that may not be controlled by Regina. Well, is, and that, is, that, that, is, that, that, is that fair? It's possible at least? Well, it's possible. The, okay. the issue is, it, there's also another segment of Regina that comes into play here. It's, there, there's a portion of the default formula that says when there's fraud or there's no reliable rent history. 
And in Regina, we read the Regina majority, and, and Judge Garcia, I know you were on that majority. We read, there's a section of Regina that says, we know what the rent is. If we know what the rent is, there's a reliable rent history. That has now handicapped people saying you can't, you can only do one of two things. You got default formula, you got four year rule for fraud. So I would, you know, if, if we want to reopen that, absolutely, because you don't have a reliable rent history here. I don't here. know if that's reopening. I think it may be that this is a different situation. And the question is, if you have a different situation, and what you're trying to do is to determine what, you know, let's assume that we think the stipulation is not a way that this can be done, right? Then it seems to me you've got, maybe there's more options, but it seems to me if, if you put aside fraud for a moment, assume, assume there's no fraud, you have, um, and if there is fraud, then I take your point. Maybe we treat it as fraud. But otherwise, maybe there's two different ways to think about it. One is you could say, I think exactly what my colleagues have been sort of intimating, which is you go back and try to figure out what the fair market rent would have been at that point. And there's, you know, I'm sure you can find people who will estimate that and, and you can have an evidentiary hearing about it and somebody will reach a decision. The other thing you do, I think, is to impose a rule that says whatever the person paid, we're going to use as the rent. I'm not suggesting that I prefer one or the other of those, but absent fraud, it seems to me, this is a different situation where what you're trying to figure out is what should the first legal rent have been, which is different from the question we were trying to address. In, really right, and, and we can answer that question. We know what the first rent should have been. Well, it's because it says it's the rent agreed to by the landlord and the tenant and reserved in a lease. Well, there and, were two numbers, yeah. excuse me, two numbers agreed to. I just, I'm so excited, <laughs> my glasses are flying off my face. <laughs> There were two numbers agreed to by, by the parties here. There was a preferential rent and there was a legal rent. Except the language in the stat or in the code section, I should say, uh, tracks the first paragraph in the party's stipulation, which says you're going to pay a rent of six fifty. We're agreeing that we're going to give you a lease that says a six fifty rental. That they can agree with the fair market rent. They can talk about fair rent all they want. The way you read the code section, it says the first rent is the rent agreed to. I mean, I would assume they're filing rent registrations while all this is going on, right? For they don't file the rent registration until this is done. Because remember, uh, and I'm taking you back to civil court days. Yeah, it's, the, it's all coming back to me the, now. The, when an apartment is rent controlled, there's one 1984 rent no rents thereafter until the apartment becomes rent stabilized. So right. not until they reach this stipulation, then there's a filing. Well, and my, my only question though is when they file that initial rent registration, they're putting the legal rent on the registration as well. They're not just reporting to DHCR what the preferential rent Correct. is. So, I mean, I think I'm still back at my question. Yes, I, I, I remember enough of this to know that it's the rent that the parties agree to, but They've agreed, to my mind, they've agreed to a couple of things. And they I'm, agreed to 650 and 1650 both, correct? No. The, careful, careful, careful. They agreed that he would register it at 1650 and McKinney would pay yeah. 650. And why does to agreed to order. mean, and so my question for you is why does agreed to mean 650 and not the 1650? Because if it means something otherwise, you've completely handicapped rent stabilization. But wouldn't that why. apply all the time then if you have a preferential rent? So if I file a statement that says $1,200 and I give you a preferential rent of 1000 because, you know, I think that's fair for you. But it, whatever happened, even if I don't have the challenge rider, the rent is still 1000 under your view? I, I could, no, no. I, well, it, the, the real answer is it depends on what year you're talking about. There's three different this answers year to that. that. We're talking about now. You, no, no, no. You can't do now because now you no, can't no, pull a preference. No, no. The year in this case. Oh, the year in this case. Okay, 2000. In the year 2000, if you reserve a preferential rent in a lease and you say you can pull that preferential rent in a lease, this is the Missionary Sisters Sir, case. What do you mean by saying you can pull that rent? So pull, when you pull a preferential rent is at renewal, it used to be that if there's a legal regulated rent of yeah. say 1500 and a preferential rent of 1000, at renewal you could pull that and go all the way up to 15000. Yeah. You can. mean you can pull it out? Yes, you can pull right. it out. Well, you refusing a lease at the preferential rent. You're going to whatever other rent. Uh, whatever the go. legal regulated yeah, yeah. rent. But and that's isn't this here. point that you're making to the extent you know it, it it's it's correct, wouldn't that be applicable only to the first rent after it moves from rent control to rent stabilization and not after that? Uh, can, can I ask you to rephrase that one for me? Sure. I take it that you are saying that we are obligated to treat the 650 
as the rent as opposed to the 1650, and that's because that's what was actually paid, and the to do otherwise would allow you to um, to, to uh, you know undermine the objectives of the rent stabilization law. Do I have, you have am that I correct. right so far? Okay, so is are you making that point? only with respect to the juncture at which an apartment moves from rent control to rent stabilization, in other words, the initial legal regulated rent, or are you arguing that that's the case going forward after that as well? No, it just matters for the first yes, tenant okay. and the way that you decontrol the unit. Because there's a difference here, Judge Garcia, between a normal preferential rent and this preferential rent. Here's the big difference. Normally, just as I was saying, you could pull a preferential rent. Here, McKinney and the respondent agreed that they would not pull the preferential so rent. So let's say that was the agreement, but it didn't have the waiver of the challenge to the fair market value. Your position then would be the same here. Exactly. The fair market va value is just a whole separate thing where McKinney says, I'm not even going to exercise. I'm waiving my rent stabilized rights. I'm not going to do that. The fact that they couldn't pull the rent, as you say, that makes it the same result. Right, because here's the problem. They, they have set one rent for McKinney set another rent for every tenant that comes after him that he never has to pay and never has any incentive no, no. Why, to pay. Why is that any different from, it's 650 this year, next year it's still 650, I don't ever pull it. What, I don't, I'm not understanding your because argument. They're, they're treating him as, his, they're treating 650 for the duration of McKinney's tenancy as a legal regulated rent. That's what they're doing. But they're registering a different legal regulated rent that they're is They're just treating it as the rent they're willing to let him pay. No, no, That's no, it's is. because it's capped. It, his, that's what the stipulation says. It's capped at rent guidelines board increases. So each year at renewal, he gets the 2%, the 4%, the 7% increase off the 650. Once he vacates, then the landlord can register it at 1650. Yes, so what you've done is you've taken away, and this is what Justice Gesmier was talking about, you've taken away the, the, um, the open arm transaction. So if they did that the every year, I'm sorry, if they did that every year, instead of doing it this way. And every year they just said to him, okay, we'll renew you at 650, that would be okay. Because they could have pulled it. It's agreeing that we won't, in your view, is what- That makes it worse, yes. It, 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 but it makes it worse, so if they did it the other way, that too would be bad. So if every year they renewed at a preferential rent, although he was not entitled to it under any of these documents, still bad. It start, the bad is the 650. It makes it worse when he's limited, uh, when there's, uh, he's waiving, uh, when there's rent guidelines board uh, increases, and it gets even worse when he waives his fair market rent appeal. Why is it Can bad at the 650? Back? I'm not understanding that. I, I'm sorry. It, uh, you said it's bad at the 650. What, explain right, that because they you. registered a lower, they, they registered that as a preferential rent, and that should have been the legal regulated rent. And you're saying you can't do that. You because, can't agree to a lower do that. preferential rent. Because they locked themselves into it. Is that what you mean? No, they did they the opposite locked of locking into themselves it and, into it. And treated it, <laughs> they locked themselves into it in the sense that they treated it as a legally recognized rent with the increases. Is that yes, what they, you mean by yes, that? Yes, I understand you. Yeah, at the 650. Thank you. Leaving aside the, um, the, the waiver of the FM, I'm sorry, Judge. Leaving aside the, the, the waiver of the FMRA and the promise not to uh, ever do anything but the preferential rent, is there any problem that you perceive with having a first stabilized lease after exit from control that contains both a preferential rent and a legal rent in it? You know, taking those other things that you don't like out of the transaction. There's nothing wrong with just having a legal rent and a preferential rate. Right? No, I disagree. It's supposed to be the rent reserved in the lease subject to a fair market rent appeal because that's what they are agreeing that the apartment is worth. So your argument would be, if you see this constellation of events, if you see a legal rent and a preferential rent in a first, uh, a first uh, uh, stabilization lease, that's, a, that's an automatic sign that you've got a, a plot to remove the apartment from regulation. It, it, it is indicia of yeah. Wait, are you telling us that that alone requires the voiding of the stipulation? In other words, the lease or not? When you say it's indicia. Okay, I think we're, this, this stipulation is different than the normal situation that Judge Canatero was talking about, where we see in a rent history, we see this. Yes. Okay. It, the stipulation itself is void. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. And is it your position that the stipulation would be void 
because of the way in which the 650 and the 1650 are set up, regardless of the FMRA waiver? If there was no waiver of the FMRA, is it your position that it would still be void? Yes, this was a circumvention of rent regulation. Okay. On the fraud question, if I can. Absolutely. Um, you suggested, I think, that that was an open issue, but the appellate division says um, that circumstances, and it lists two, one of them is evidence of fraud, I'm at 162 of the record, are not present here. So why hasn't the appellate division concluded that there is no evidence of fraud here? Oh, that's a big question. Okay. So. Well, I look forward to your answer. Here, 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 here's essentially what has happened recently. Um, if you look at the three cases cited in Regina, Thornton, Grimm, and Connaughton, the yeah. murderer's row of rent stabilization cases, in those cases, n reliance would never have been present. Then Regina comes along. Regina footnote seven cites those three cases with approval. And then it gets into, and then it says in footnote seven, Fraud exists of the common law fraud definition, the anti reliance, all of those things. Yeah. Okay. The first department has now taken that in, and the second department has too, in a case called Grid Gridley, which is my case, uh, and Woodson is actually my case as well. It has taken that and said, you have to prove common law fraud, and actually in Burroughs, it says as long as there's a public rep. Uh, yeah, I uh, take it they're distinguishing between fraud and, and something that would require. For example, here, if, if we were to agree with you that a stipulation be voided. In other words, something can be void as against public policy. I take the suggestion is here and not fraudulent. Do you agree that that's consistent with the appellate division's reading? Well, the appellate division's reading has now been superseded. That, that's what I'm getting at. So when they're reading fraud, they're talking about scienter, reliance, those sorts of things. However, on March 1st, 2024, Governor Hochul signed into law the recent amendments to the rent regulations, which says it's not common law fraud. It says you're supposed to consider the totality of the circumstances. And if the totality of the circumstances indicate that the landlord was taking some act in violation of law, that's fraud. So Are it's you a, suggesting there's fraud here? Is that your bottom line? Under that definition, I am suggesting that we're not there yet because we're not a liability okay. determination. So you're basically saying that, that you could contemplate, sorry, Chief, I see his light is on, but that you could contemplate arguing that this amendment from two months ago allows you to argue that there was fraud back in 20, 2000. Absolutely. Okay. And one last question, if I can. What about, what about repose concerns? I mean, this was a long time ago. It was a long time and, ago. And your position seems to me to be that that has no relevance here. Zero. Okay, and, and why exactly should we be comfortable with that? Because there is no statute of limitations to the deregulation of an apartment. So if we, if we agree with you that this is a status question and not a rent amount question, it could be 50 years, doesn't matter, is your Absolutely. 35 or three. Uh, and then, then that goes to the RSL, which says you have to keep re records four years before the last registration. So if this is a status question, do we need to, is it necessary that we say more than simply a reversal? That is, do we need to say, here's what has to happen next or how it should happen? No, absolutely not. I mean, I'd, I'd love for some discussion of fraud and the new amendments, and everything, but we don't have to get there. We get to, it's a simple question, status question. Uh, we, we've gotten where we need to be, reverse. <laughs> Thank it sounds so to me like the reason why you're so confident in your answer to the chief judge on that is that the only option available on remand would be the default formula as far as, as, far as you see it. Is that fair to say? I, I wouldn't go that far. I think there, there's a, a, a certainly a possibility that they could, you know, say their counsel told them this was okay and therefore the four-year rule applies. Um, and it's not really the four-year rule. It's June 14th, 2015. But um, I, I think that that is, I feel comfortable going down and making an argument that they've reached an illegal agreement and there's no reliable rent history. May it please the court, Mark Zauderer for respondent. I think there have been some serious distortions in that presentation and I'm going to take the opportunity to address them. First of all, I think to get to the heart of this case, one has to go back to 2000 and how this arose. You had here somebody who had only a claim, it was a squatter in the view of the landlord. And they litigated, there's no question that what they litigated here was a bona fide dispute and a bona fide settlement. 
And what the landlord did was in complete compliance with the law as it was in 2000. I followed it. You know, I think we agree to the general principle that something is legal until it's illegal. In other words, a statute or some court decision has to make it illegal. So look at the situation the landlord was in. He had a tenant who was claiming it could be a stabilized tenant, which he didn't recognize. It could be 30 years, 40 years. He could even perhaps pass on the apartment with another succession claim. So he entered into a compromise and basically uh, did what uh, was required under the law, not just what was permitted. Counsel, it sounds like you're articulating the same set of facts that the appellate division approved of in Kent. I'm sorry, over here. I'm sorry. In Kent. Yeah. That's the holding of Kent, isn't it? That, that, you know, they negotiated, they had no status, and they got a good deal because, you know, it's entirely possible that they could have been thrown out of the apartment had they not made this deal. Is, is, is that essentially what you're saying now? Well, I'm saying something else in addition, which, which is that he followed the law. Section uh, 2521.1 has to be read with the succeeding session. It does two things. It says that the landlord must reach agreement. He had to do this to implement the stipulation on what the legal rent was. And the next section says if the legal rent is different from a, a, a lower rent, that is a preferred rent. And then when it, that is over, at some point, you go back to the registered but rent. So let me, let he me followed ask. it. He followed the statute. Let me, so let me, let me ask you this. Sure. Suppose they had agreed that the rent actually paid would be 650 as it was, yes. and the legal rent that they registered would be $100,000 a month. Right. Yeah. I that just, still follows the law. Okay. Uh, there's, I'm not wise enough to say where that limiting principle would be. There's some suggestion that in the law that if it was over the 2,000 amount, you know, it would take it out of regulation and be impermissible. I don't know that. But the, that's not this case. I, I don't think we need to set so the, but it, I would say you, on its face that would look ridiculous. Right. And so it yes. would look ridiculous because we don't think that that 10000 or $100,000 bears any reasonable relationship to what the fair market value of the apartment was at the time. Yes. Fair market rental value. Correct. Right. So is it fair to say that what, what the statute is aiming to do in setting that first deregulated rent is to establish the fair market rental value of the apartment and then stabilize that value. Yes, but there's nothing in this record to suggest that that deviated from it. And there was nothing the landlord could do in this situation. But the thing that does suggest that to me is the waiver of the right to challenge the fair market rent. Because I take your argument up to this point to go to they didn't have to offer him a rent control deal. They were settling that. And I think no one's looking to argue here that the apartment is still rent controlled. And then it becomes a rent stabilization issue. And they offer him a lease, and they're doing it this way. The problem, I think, I'm having at least, is yeah. the waiver of challenging the fair market value. Because that doesn't only, according to our precedent and appellate division precedent, go to that tenant at the time. It goes forward to future tenants. So allow me to address that, if I may. I think if we put in our mind's eye, let's go back to 2020, uh, to 2000, uh, and let's assume that the landlord was prescient and know we'd be having this argument today. He could not make that settlement, because on the one hand, in any settlement, which there was, you give up something and you get something. Well, he gave up gives the, up his rent control argument. He gave up. He gave up, that tenant had, uh, in the landlords, you had no right to anything. It was a squatter. But that's the compromise, right? That was, he gives yes, up his, that claim, and yes. you give him a rent control. So now, stabilized right. apartment. So to address your question, I think it's very important to recognize what this court said in Riverside in 2008, which I'm, gonna, I'm going to come to. But all the cases which are underlying the principle that you're asserting are completely different from this. Those are cases where there is a benchmark there was an established rent, such as in rent stabilization. And what was done here was an, a, a, to ignore that. And for example, if it says it's $2,000, and in, in the cases that are cited, the uh, tenant and landlord reach an agreement for $3,000. That's a demonstrable illegal agreement. In this case, there was no benchmark. There was no established rent, legal rent. And the landlord did what he was commanded to in that situation, by following the regulations. Which but what about, what about your adversary's argument that by allowing for the initial legal regulated rent to be 
set, at least ostensibly, significantly higher than what was actually paid, that that provides a ready path towards evading um, the objectives of the rent stabilization laws. And that's a problem with the legislature. I mean, the landlord, in his wisdom, well, followed what and, the and law And therefore told is precluded. It's not something that's permissible, I think, is what he's arguing, not that there should be and, legislative and say, change. Right. And I say you would not, not find that impermissible in the situation the landlord was in when he followed what the regulation well, said. I don't know if that's necessarily impermissible. Obviously, they're negotiating a lease as a right. part of contract as well as a property interest. Okay. And they're trying to get, yes, of course. And they're trying to get out from under the, the risk. Both of them are taking a major risk if they proceed with the litigation, right? One may be out on the street, one may have a rent control tenant, right? The, the big risk. Okay. Every, everybody's got an interest perhaps in getting out of this in a way that's fair. I'm with uh, uh, my colleagues that there seems to really be a problem with a stipulation that says you waive an appeal to the fair market rent. That's so, what's, I don't think the 650 is that controversial. It's this issue of you're waiving that because the 650 only applies to you in that sense because you're calling it a preferential rent. But this other fair market rent that now someone who would otherwise perhaps be incentivized to challenge has gotten a deal so they're not going to do that, means that all the other tenants pay a price. You could not have a settlement in, unless that. You're not going to make a settlement and say, well, Well, you I'll could give make the settlement. It's just your, your client didn't want, or the, the person at the time, the, the entity at the time, didn't want to risk the appeal, and they wouldn't get whatever it was, the 1650 So mark. to answer your question. You could, I'm sorry, I just want to clarify something you just said to Judge Robert. Sure. You're saying you could not have had a settlement without a provision in the stipulation that the tenant waives their right to a fair market rent the, appeal? The landlord would never settle. Be, look, let, may I? Well, look. Well, you, you know, that might be a, 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 a strong negotiating posture for the landlord to take, but we've learned in the years since this stipulation was entered into that that's, that's actually violative of public policy. I respectfully disagree. Let me uh, get to the, uh, the court's decision in, in Riverside in 2008. There they found an illegal agreement of the kind I described, where there was a benchmark and an attempt to agree on a number that was demonstrably different from the, the lower number that was legal. And this court said, if I might remind it, in finding the agreement that said within neither the letter nor spirit of the law, because it was not a bona fide settlement of the party's dispute, the argument for upholding the agreement would be stronger if in 1996 the parties had had a dispute about the amount of the legal maximum rent and had compromised it at a figure above the tenants and below the landlords. And they go on to say the obvious purpose of the settlement was not to resolve a dispute about what the law permitted, but to achieve something the law indisputably does not, and does not permit. And there is an affirmative policy here of encouraging uh, in disputed matters settlement. There was not, nothing illegal about yes, this. Yes, well, without violating public policy. I mean, that, you're kind of going around in circles on this. Yes, of course. Of course, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I can't see the issue over the 650, but the question is whether or not the waiver is a violation of public policy because one could see it as rigging the game moving forward. You could see that, but you could also look at it from the perspective as what was the option of a landlord in this situation? Well, if we see it that way, do you lose? Sorry? If we see it that way, is rigging the game moving forward, do you lose? I, I'm sorry. If, you, if you, indeed, yes. you said you could see it that way, but I said you could see it as, as yes. perhaps yes. And, changing and things I, moving I, forward. I, if we see it that way, right. and I suggest do you lose? Does he win? I, but I suggest to you that is the way that this should be looked at from the perspective of the policy of promoting a settlement. Uh, are are and, you suggesting that the, that the price of 1650 was fair at that time and therefore this, um, this agreement, this settlement, there was nothing un untoward about it? Is that your suggestion? And, it was that, and it, was that in fact true? Was that rent um, commiserate with what was being received at that time there's nothing in, in the era. record to say that it wasn't and again put it in perspective if you might of the landlord in that situation the law does not require the landlord to do a survey of the market and to see what it is the landlord the the law tells them agree on a rent you can and, have and what a is the rent. effect over here yes, what is sorry. the effect that he never was going to pay this the 1650 
Well, when you say what is the effect, I'm not sure. The, the idea, he gets this lower rent. Right. So it looks a little untoward that he's getting around the, um, the law by, by doing something that he's not, otherwise not permitted to do. I, I agree to this, you can set this higher rent, but I'm never going to pay it. Yes, and that's expressly what the law says is okay. It's section 25, uh, 2521.2. It says where the legal regulated rent is established and a rent lower than the legal negotiated rent is charged and paid by the tenant, upon vacancy of such tenant, the legal regulated rent previously established plus the applicable guideline increases uh, may be charged to new tenants. And so is the, the legal regulated rent established in this situation where you have the first lease after the apartment is leaving rent control? It, it's being set and it will be registered, but it, 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 yes. that's not the same thing as being established. I mean, it, it sounds to me like we're talking about the sort of situation where you might be entitled to make some sort of overcharge claim because there is an established legal rent and you're being charged, you know, something else. But to, I think what your adversary was saying, and I asked him about this, about whether the first lease could have a preferential rent and a, a legal rent, and he said no, because the first lease is the one that sets the rent. So it's not established. I, I disagree. Section, these two sections are part of the same law. They are one after the other. The first, 25, 21.1, talks about the rent agreed to. And the very next section refers back to that as the established rent. That's what's in 2521. Yeah, I, That's what think, they established I, by agreement. But I think they that, have to be yeah, married together. Yeah, but I think you conceded earlier that it can't simply be any rent agreed to, right? There's some point, and you said you can't draw the line, and I accept that. Yes. There's some point where it just doesn't work to say, well, we agreed to some number. And I have to say that something that you know I, I looked a little strangely at is the, the tenant here um, gets a $650 rent for an apartment that is worth $1,650 a month rent, and he can keep that for as long as he wants, and he moves out the next year. I wouldn't do that. Now, we don't know. Maybe he got well, sick. We, maybe we he got a job nothing, somewhere else. Maybe whatever. Yeah. But it, it's a lot. But from the landlord's point of view, that tenant may be there forever. That's a big, big risk from the landlord's point of view. Yep. On the other hand, what happened here, perhaps unexpectedly, the tenant moved out within a year or two. But at the time this agreement was made, or, nobody could know when, if the tenant might move out, right. whether succession rights would be claimed and passed or, or on to somebody else. perhaps the deal wasn't really as good as it looks on paper. It wasn't really a 1650 apartment. It was really a 650 apartment all along. We don't know. We don't know. I don't think, based on the conduct here, that anybody suggests it was really as low as 650. Council, let's based see. Based on what happened, and we have in the record, the next tenant paid. No, it's a know. big jump from what the rent control was. I mean, the rent control was yes, not even 200. I mean, up. it's a lot to pay. Right? Now, the, tenant was ha the tenant wasn't, if there was arm twisting, the advantage was to the tenant because the tenant, um, you know, could have, you know, 650 was willing to pay because probably, to answer your question, it's b well below market. Council, let's say we were to find a waiver void on public policy grounds. What one would we then be doing with this case? And if we did send it back, what would happen in the proceedings below? I, I'd suggest that there's, that's not the appropriate path because the- Assume we do it, appropriate or not, in your yeah, view. Yeah. What would happen? Well, you know, the parties charted their own course here. They litigated this as a legal issue. No factual issues in this case. That's the way it was presented. But it's a motion to dismiss. Right. So presumably, yeah. as with any motion to dismiss, if we reach that conclusion, something would happen next. I disagree in this path, in this, where the way the case was argued, nobody argued. The plaintiff didn't argue, which they normally do in opposition to a motion to dismiss, that they're factual issues. They haven't argued that. They've argued on its face that it's illegal, and we've argued on the face it's legal. So I don't think there's a you know, a logical basis to send this back. But let's say we say it's illegal because the waiver's void for public policy. Then they just win, we don't have to send it back, we just, well, what do we do? I, what, what do they win? Right. I think- Are they going to DHCR, what are they, what are they doing? I'm sorry, I think- Are they going to DHCR, what are they doing? What are they doing? If we don't remit. If you don't, 
I suggest that we've presented the right path to a legal conclusion on this. Uh, if you send it back, I don't think there's uh, any precedent for this that I could cite. But, that would but be if right. we disagree with you, yes. and and we are not persuaded, do you have any views on how the case might unfold going forward? I think that um, I think that would be presumptuous of me, frankly, okay. to suggest that path to you. Can I ask I, you about your statute of limitations uh, yes. defense? If we were to disagree with you and conclude that this was a status case and not a case about the amount of rent, um, does your statute of limitations defense have any remaining viability? And if so, why or how? The first is I would respectfully disagree with that premise for this. I understand that. But, I, but I'd, I'd like to explain that for a moment. Okay. Why Maybe you could start with the second part of my. Of course. With the so I think uh, still you would not meet the bar, which is fraud. There's no evidence here. In fact, the appellate division found no evidence of fraud. So I don't think you could, even in a status case, get to the point where you would be ignoring the statute of limitations because there's no evidence of fraud. There's no basis for fraud here. The way I've described it, I don't think anyone could take issue with. Uh, there's nothing in the record to suggest that this was some nefarious scheme. But I thought your adversary was arguing, and, and maybe you have a different view. I'm sure he'll tell me if he wasn't arguing this, that, that a question of the status of an apartment, whether it's rent stabilized, whether it's not, uh, is something that, for which there is no applicable statute of limitations. Do you have a different take on that? I have, I agree that if it's status, under certain circumstances, there could be no statute of limitations. Okay. And I'm, what I'm saying, I'm engrafting on that, is that that would have to rise to fraud, not just simply because of status that necessarily would so you, allow So your position revisit. is that, that the status of an apartment, rent stabilized or not, can only uh, be contested after four years if there's an allegation of fraud? What, what, yes. What exactly is the support for that? that, that, that that's my contention. The, the, the synthesis of the case law, I don't see anything that says that you can open this up just because I mean, it's... That's kind of what the AHSTPA yeah. was at the time, wasn't it? That, that was the, the four-year window that you're provided, right? Yes, but I read into, I engraft in, these, in the case law that, that there has to be some element of fraud. Uh, and, and what I, about public policy? It does, it, 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 assuming, and it, this is a difficult if, but if there is a distinction between fraud and void on public policy grounds, wouldn't public policy also open up the status question as well as, as, as capably as fraud would? I, in theory, yes, but I don't believe there's a public policy that's negatively impl implicated here. And I'd like to address that premise, before I, if I may. Look, the complaint here, it's at page 24 of the record. This was pled as a rent dispute. At, who was the politician that said the rent is too damn high? That's what they say in paragraph 10. of. They're not disputing the status on their own complaint in this case. They say the following. The so-called preferential rent of $650 represents the grant agreed to by the owner and the tenant and should have been the unit's legal regulated rent with all subsequent increases based off that lower number. They're complaining about the rent. Is They're that an overcharge we want it to be claim? Do you view that as an overcharge claim, basically? Yes, I do. That's what the way they've pled it. They say, well, they, they, also they say, say in their the brief, the purported we, deregulation sorry? is illegal and plaintiffs are entitled to the benefits and protections of rent stabilization. I'm sorry, they say that? They also make the argument yeah. in the complaint, um, they make the allegation that the purported, I'm just quoting from it, it's the next page, the purported deregulation is illegal and plaintiff is entitled to the benefits and protections of rent stabilization. Right. The deregulation only occurred by fortuity two years later when the rent went over 2000 If he had stayed there, it would have been for, for years or perhaps decades that way. That's what they're referring to. This current tenant, the tenant who's in this case, yeah. they, they entered into a market rate yes. lease, right? This yes. was not a stabilized lease. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, 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 a couple of quick points. You heard my adversary say, oh, well, landlords don't do surveys. You know, they're not required to do this. Well, that's the whole point of a fair market rent appeal is that DHCR does that, and it operates as a check on the system. Because what happens? Apartments in Manhattan in, and now elsewhere are, are but then scarce. You, but then your argument's going to be, OK, so now whatever that number was, I think it was 1650, excuse me, I've forgotten momentarily. 
That was the wrong number, right? You're saying you're going to do the analysis, you're going to figure it out. This is the correct number, and now you're going to move forward. And so isn't the end point of that, uh, from your client's perspective, I will pay less rent? And I might have even paid too much rent? I've got an Correct. overcharge and I'm going to get reimbursed? If, isn't if that the, the way point that of all we are, of that? If the way that we are resolving this, which we have not yet got there, yes. is to say we have to rejigger the rent. We have to go all the way back. Yes, you'd have to make out that 1650 was not a fair market rent at that time. Right, and there, and there is evidence in the record that it is not a fair market rent. Um, as, because what happens is after Mr. McKinney vacates, they do a substantial rehab of an apartment that hadn't been touched since the 1970s because it's rent controlled, and then the tenant pays 1650. So, you know, it, We've all lived in apartments. We know what, you know, you're going to pay more for an apartment that is a, 60, a brand new apartment than one that has brown shag carpeting. It's Council, just the nature. One, one of the things I think has been touched upon, I think, by Judge Halligan and, and others is this idea that we have a 20-year-old agreement. And, and in many of the cases, and maybe not all, but many of them, it's the issue is I enter an agreement with a tenant, landlord, tenant, Tenant then thinks better of this later on and challenges that agreement, saying it's void against public policy or whatever reason, and it's that type of dispute. But here you have a tenant who goes in 20 years later, pays a, a market rent, um, gets into a dispute over what that rent should be, goes back 20 years, finds this agreement, then brings this case based on a 20-year-old agreement between different parties. And I think what I'm struggling with, is there a limiting principle here? I mean, uh, can every tenant now go dig through the records and say, okay, what types of agreements were there? And maybe this one might be void, we'll bring an action, and then the next 40 years of rents are you know, kind of undone, and those tenants in between, can then now they join? What? There, what? Is, there, is, there absolutely is a limiting factor, and the limiting factor is deregulation. I can, unless I can allege fraud in a normal rent stabilized context, I can't go back more than four years. This is pre-HSDPA. We don't need to go so there. So then do you need to show fraud here in order to get No, anything? because I'm challenging the deregulation. So fraud is not a limiting principle here. So no. what is a limiting so principle? The limiting principle is saying fraud or deregu... Oh, I'm sorry. Judge, I, no, I, just no. to clarify Judge Garcia's question before you answer, are you saying the limiting principle is as long as you're within four years of the deregulation, you're okay? No, you can challenge a deregulation at any time. So, That's what the, so there, the, is, there is no limiting period. There is no limiting period, unless there's not a deregulation. And I'm sorry if I wasn't being clear. If it's a normal rent-stabilized lease, if uh, uh, Ms. Liggett had a normal rent-stabilized lease, unless she can allege fraud, she can't go pre base No, but this is a market lease. And, right. and this, this apartment exited rent regulation before she entered into her lease. And I think I just heard you say that even if that had happened 15 years before she signed her lease, she still had the right to go back and challenge the exit from regulation. Because of the way that this agreement was set up. This agreement was an agreement between McKinney and respondent that they never met in the middle. Anyone, they in met in the middle luxury, okay. anyone in an apartment that was luxury deregulated who's paying a market rent in a luxury building now can go back to the files for 40 years looking for agreements that they can argue vo void against public policy. Absolutely. Thank and their damages would be limited to a four-year period from whenever it is they filed? Yes, if it was filed before June 14th of 2019. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.